Let's read this. Uh, good morning, and uh, thanks very much for coming to the workshop this morning. Um, I'm going to try and hold my notes and click the, the clicker thing, but I might have to abandon one or the other. Um, my name is Dinah Aiken, and I'm here today with my colleague Nell Page uh, to introduce you to the Salveson Mind Room Centre and explain the services we provide. And we hope that this will uh, put us in a position where we might be able to support you to work with families that have a child or a young person, particularly someone affected by a learning difficulty. In, in the session, we're going to talk about our uh, service um, and demonstrate our method of working and give examples of some of the practical resources that we provide. There, there are circulating some um, slides from today and uh, a booklet called Top 10 Tips for Parents. So if you don't get it immediately, it should come to you and we can certainly let you have some at the end. Um, we will try to offer you the chance to respond to what we're saying as we go uh, through the presentation and we'll try and leave time for a bit of discussion at the end because I think that would be uh, really interesting. So that's us. So the organisation was uh, set up originally as Mindroom and it was established by a parent in, in the year 2000. And it's really grown from a sort of kitchen table organisation to the current size. We have 10 staff at the moment and we're recruiting, so hopefully we'll soon be up to 12. We do cover the whole of Scotland uh, and this is our vision. So it's a world where no mind is left behind and every person with learning difficulties receives the recognition and support they need to achieve their potential. So what we're trying to help uh, people do is access better support, feel more empowered and to promote effective engagement. Um, we occupy a, a niche in the voluntary sector because we don't demand a diagnosis before um, families can seek our help. And we very much promote collaborative working wherever we can. And we always keep the child at the centre, as, as do we all. So this is how we set out our vision. I'm not expecting you to read the small print, but it's really just to let you know that we work around four aims of empowering families, uh, leading research, developing knowledge and awareness, and collaborating and influencing. And our vision of how we're going to build up the Salveson Mind Room Centre as we develop and grow is to focus on all four of those areas. And we're very active in all four of those areas. But for today, we're just going to focus on the first of those four aims there, um, empowering families. And we'll look at how we do this through providing a service that we call um, direct help and support. Um, but before we embark on that story, we did want to show you this slide. Um, our founder, Sophie Dow, uh, who has a child with uh, learning difficulties, and that's what brought her into this. Um, she was adamant that hope should be present in all the work that we do. And we believe that hope and optimism should be core within the lives of all children and young people. And the words on the side are ones that we just gathered as a team in the office uh, to represent how we felt we were working to try and make this aspiration into a reality. So another visualisation of the work we do is as an outreach model. And the main element of this, as you can see, child, young person and family at the centre. The current structure and the skill set of our team, as Nell will explain, it means that we do work um, principally with parents and carers. Um, so they're what you might call our client, but um, the focus always stays on the child or the young person's needs. And we are actually recruiting for a young person's worker at the moment, so we hope to be able to engage um, directly with children and young people as, as we um, progress. So I'm about to hand over to Nell, but um, just before I do, uh, there were two things that we wanted to flag up. One is that we recognise that there isn't a neat divide between parents and professionals. Lots of you will be both. Um, but as you're here, there is a bit of a divide in, in the way that people come to us to access our service. And the second thing is that we do know that schools are great places doing great things and that there's some really excellent practice going on. Um, in fact, most of the resources and um, practice that we adopt is stuff that we've seen working well in schools. But the, the thing is, for a service like ours, we only get to hear from parents and indeed our professionals when things have gone wrong. So, you know, we know you're doing great stuff, but this is a wee bit of the dark side, um, if you can bear with it. There's lunch afterwards, so there's, you know, you can finish on a high. So I'm going to hand over to Nell. Thank you. 
uh, at this point. Thank you. So our key service is the one-to-one -one support that we offer families. We call this our direct help and support service, which we shorten to DHS. So when I say DHS, that's what I'm talking about. The individual nature of the support is so important because the families often find that the situation they're in is incredibly stressful for all sorts of reasons. This picture and all the paperwork on the table shows a case in progress for us, and it gives an idea of the volume of paperwork that can group around a single child or young person. And that's a really stressful situation, and it can be completely overwhelming for the parents or carers that we're supporting. So having support from us at the Sowerson Mind Dream Centre can help reduce stress for everyone in the family. Our first step is to inform and empower parents. It's so important that they have the correct information and to know the rights and entitlements for their child. And with this type of knowledge, it's much easier for them then to ask for help and for services from schools, from health professionals and from social care. Sometimes they've really got to stand their ground and insist that something's done. And having that knowledge behind them is, is vital to help them do that. And it, they find it really empowering. Children and young people, as you all know, have a wide range of rights. The right to an education, the right to be educated so they can achieve their full potential, the right not to be discriminated against, and so on. And so we try and make sure that everybody understands that these are rights um, and that we're clear that these rights must be upheld. And that, that includes professionals as well. We all assume that professionals are experts but sometimes we find that they're just as lost as the families as to what to do to help a child. We try and work in a way that ensures that professionals become more aware of the needs of children and young people, who has a duty to meet those needs, and how best it can be done. In our working practice, we, we, we're not confrontational when we're working with professionals, and we try and help the families that we're supporting to find a way forward that's non-confrontational as well. We know that our DHS service is needed because we're always busy. As far as we can, we try and step into that gap and help families feel supported and more confident to secure appropriate help, both now and for situations in the future. So why do the parents who contact us need support? I'm going to start off with some statistics. In 2017, more than a quarter of pupils in Scottish schools were recorded as having additional support needs. It's estimated that five children in every classroom has a learning difficulty. In a recent report, two out of three pupils with a learning disability or autism said that, they'd been, that, that they had been bullied, um, which has clear consequences for their mental health. Children with an additional support need are 4.9, so it's effectively five times more likely to be excluded from school. So this slide shows the extent of the drop in ASL specialist teachers, which sits in contrast to the growing number of pupils recorded as having additional support needs. Children often feel that they're being punished because of their additional support needs, and many are experiencing bullying. There's an alarming rise in the number of pupils experiencing mental health issues and a concerning failure of the child and adolescent mental health services to provide much needed support in a timely manner. So this slide, can you all see that okay? Okay. It shows how the statistics I've been talking about translate into the cases that I'm dealing with on a daily basis in the DHS team. In the slides to follow, I'm going to try and put even more context around the, the reality of daily life for these families. So many parents who contact us tell us that their child's been excluded, and it's quite common for us to hear that this is happening to children who are really young in primary school. We often hear as well parents saying that because their young person can't or won't engage with services, those services are immediately withdrawn. Sometimes plans are put in place for children or young people, but we're finding they don't necessarily reflect the small steps which are needed to facilitate a good outcome. For example, the focus might be on a work placement for a young person when the reality is they haven't been in school for more than a year and the focus needs to be getting them back in in that first instance. So last year, we responded to an average of 26 initial inquiries each month and had between 204 and 259 active cases during that year. We were engaged in 25 out of 32 of the local authorities and we distributed 85,000 copies of our publication, It Takes All Kinds of Minds, 
So we've been really busy and there is a continuing demand for our services. So this slide shows a snapshot of our stats from one quarter last year. We work to support families so that every child receives the right support to attend school and to achieve their potential. The issues raised by callers are led by their primary concerns. Education issues shown here in the different shades of green, um, they're often the lead issue. However, the lead issue could be health, which is blue, or social work, which is purple. In reality, families who have a child with learning difficulties are always concerned about health issues and very often have social work involvement as well. So a case that begins with a caller wanting to talk to me about education will often really quickly stray into health and social work issues as well. We help families address issues with physical and mental health and well-being, as well as the social and emotional aspects of their child's life. Children and young people with a le learning difficulty are so likely to become socially isolated it can be really hard to make and sustain friendships if you communicate in an unusual way or if they behave in, in a way that's different to their peers. A lot of the parents that we speak to find that they find getting an inclusive sport or leisure provision for their young person is really difficult. We try and be mindful of the needs of the wider family and aim to provide information and advice that will support the parents, the siblings and, and the, to support the overall family life. It's quite something when we think about parents and carers contending with a child who's really struggling, maybe has chronic sleep issues. They're also trying to hold down a job, spend time with their other children and dealing with a dozen professionals at a time. So as you're all aware, it's national policy that every child should be educated in a mainstream setting. And that's a parental choice many of the families that we're working with take. But as enabled, who are shown in this picture, showed in their well research document and campaign included in the main, mainstream education often leaves children lonely, subject to bullying, and not achieving their full potential. We've supported many parents to seek alternatives to mainstream, and it often involves a contested process using the, using the placing request procedures in their local authority. As a result of the mainstreaming policy, teachers could be supporting children with any combination from the range of conditions giving rise to learning difficulties. In our experience, it's really common to see these coexisting and overlapping. That means that the issues faced by the children and young people are complex, and the solutions to support them really need to be tailored to the individual. So I'm going to show you some images to highlight the impact of everyday struggles on children with additional support needs. Just shout out if you've got any ideas what these pictures might represent. So we've got an iceberg, a fizzing Coke bottle, and a pile of bricks. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think for that iceberg, it, it's representing... There's so much more going on underneath that you, you're just not seeing, and that's nobody's fault. You, you're just not aware of it. Absolutely. Anything else? Call a bottle silly, Coke start, to get through the crowd, leg crowd too small, then by the end of the day, it's hard to show, hard to get to the school. Yeah, absolutely. When I'm, when I'm talking to parents, I'll quite often explain that you can't see that the bottle of Coke's being shaken up. And the, the, the shakes might be something that you, you wouldn't even think of. It's that the room's too hot, the lights are too bright, they've not understood an instruction, their clothes are itching them, anything like that. And so each little shake builds up and builds up. We quite often find it's not until you take the cap off, and that's usually when they get home, that there's this massive explosion. Absolutely. And what about the, the tonne of bricks? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a young person explain this to us, that he felt in school that he was just, more and more bricks were being added onto him all of the time until by the end of the day, he just felt so completely weighed down that he couldn't do anything else. And that really resonated with us. It, it gave me a real idea of what it was actually like for him. So we've talked about the effect of the daily pressures um, for these children and young people with additional support needs. One of the consequences for families of their child not being suitably supported 
is that school attendance becomes an issue and then it becomes a battleground, both within the family and between the family and the local authority. We commonly hear these reasons listed um, as the reasons for non-attendance. And obviously dropping behind in school is potentially really damaging for a young person's education. It leaves them isolated and they become much more distant from their peer group. We're aware of children who've barely had any teaching for more than a year at a time, and that's not just one isolated case for us. We also know that there's not good data around this issue, but it is something that we're hearing from the families that we're supporting. We know it's an issue that Education Scotland's really concerned about, and it's one that we try and raise at a high level wherever we can. For example, we sit on some national policy groups, such as the advisory group on additional support for learning. So the additional support for learning legislation puts the burden on the education authorities to provide adequate and efficient support. In complex cases, the child or young person would be entitled to a CSP. So you'd get significant support from outside agencies all laid out in a beautiful statutory plan. However, in practice, there are very few CSPs. 0.3% of children with additional support needs in Scotland have a CSP. And in complex cases where there isn't one, you guys in schools are still required to have input from other agencies to support these children and young people. Our caseload has numerous instances where families need help to manage their children's behaviour. So many of these parents and carers feel mistrustful of social work, so it's really hard for me to convince them that having that input can, can have a massive positive impact. However, we have also sat in on meetings where social work support has been at best inadequate and negligent at worst. In the health service, as you all know, the massively long waiting times, which sometimes result, results in no diagnosis for these children. The lack of CAM services is well known. Uh, there is an 18 week um, target time, which is often not met. And locally, children and young people won't be seen by CAMs unless there's a comorbidity. We also found that counselling provisions are, are patchy. So we came across this study, um, which shows the issues faced by professionals who are trying to secure support for the children and young people they're working with. This study shows that a referral to CAMS is much more likely to be rejected if it's made by a teacher. I know. There isn't a magic formula for accessing services, and sometimes it comes down to persistence and having a really strong voice. Because of the burdens that they're carrying, the families that we're supporting struggle with that, and that's where we can step in. So I just want to take a moment, because I've bombarded you with statistics, just to see if anything resonates and whether there's any comments so far. Was this the workshop you were expecting to come to? Just into the camps you're talking about mm -hmm. there, the three fibrosis in referrals, and they're not back, not back, not, yep. not just the camps. Mm -hmm. You're like, what, what, what are we doing wrong with that? Do you know what we're doing this? Yeah. People need yeah, absolutely. So, and then, uh, sorry, I, I missed the start of your workshop, so I don't know if you've already explained this, but say, um, where, um, how do people get in contact with you? How do they know about you? So uh, we'll go through this at the end, how to make a referral, but it's really easy. It's by phone or email, basically. So can anybody do that? They've got to go through the school first? Got no. To go no. The, the majority of parents refer themselves to us. Okay. It, it's the kind of word of mouth we're finding at the moment. And then you'll yeah. get in touch with... We can step in at that higher level if we need to. Yeah, I'm going to go on in a minute to talk a bit more about this, this staged approach that we have, so hopefully you'll have a clearer idea by the end of, of how we work and what we're doing. If that sounds okay. Yeah. I think it's interesting how complex teachers' roles are becoming because yeah. they have quite a significant input over the past years at different jobs and being able to work mm -hmm. and actually supporting parents to approach CAMS and to check that CAMS have been yep. um, received at the same size that you did to fill in the form appropriately. And what happens in the interim, and also how challenged teachers are perhaps with actually coping and supporting absolutely with that behaviour in the classroom. Yeah, so it's really quite a complex yes. world. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so great that you are getting to work with. Great, yeah. great. We've also got like some of the issues as well with the parental involvement with yeah. the parents that are more difficult. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the kids would go to wherever and get help, or would, you know, yeah. or would go or come and listen to somebody, but we can't get the parents to, to, to take them or to come to someone. We can't even get them on the phone. Yeah, yeah. And what I'm going to go on to talk about is a bit more about in our service 
how we try and engage with parents and some tips that we give parents to, to move situations forward themselves. Penumbra, and, yeah. Uh, we've got a draw pen that the kids just kind of literally just go and sit down. Great. And I know that works really well yeah. in terms of actual referral. They don't know. Is that what I don't know? Yeah, that's really lucky. Great. Okay, I'm mindful of the time. I know we could have a massive discussion about this all day. But if I tell you a bit more about how we do what we do. So the direct help and support team offers practical and emotional support to parents and carers of young people up to the age of 25. Our approach is non-confrontational, but we support the parents and carers to have their voices heard. In the first instance, this is done by providing a listening ear. We take lots of time during that first contact just to explore the issues that the caller's facing. In some cases, they say to me that it's the first time that anybody's listened to what they had to say, um, and the call then becomes a chance for them to offload often years of frustration. During that call, I will be trying to get them to focus on what's happening right now and what it is that we can do to change the situation. Sometimes I then need to go away and do some specific research and find them appropriate services. So I'll end that call by agreeing with them what I'm going to do, what would be the most appropriate support for them. Um, and I always give them a time scale in which I'm going to do that. After that call, I'll go away and do the research. And I very often follow up with an email if that's the most appropriate way for the parent. Sometimes it's not. Some people aren't happy with resources by email. They don't have an email address. They would much prefer a letter in the post. Some have problems with literacy and would like me to phone them back and talk about the research that I have. And I'm really happy to work in whatever way suits them best because otherwise I can't do my job if they can't access the service. So that initial call will then be followed up in maybe three weeks with a further discussion and more information and advice if they want it. We're not going to push a service that they don't want, but if they want us, we're there and we're really happy to continue. If the parent is requiring um, a more intensive level of support, like you were asking about, we can do that. And that would be somebody to liaise with professionals on their behalf and perhaps to go along to um, a meeting as their supporter. So what we would do then is allocate somebody from our team to take on the case as more of a casework role. Bearing in mind, we're a really small organisation based in Edinburgh and we're covering the whole of Scotland. So we're trying to make sure that the parents have the, the, the knowledge to do this themselves, but we can step in. I'm just going to give a bit more context around this approach in the next few slides. So our USP involves a form of support to families which is informed by expert knowledge of education especially, but also health, social work, law and policy. We know how to help families manage this tsunami of paperwork and how to manage a range of meetings from the small and personal ones to the big and scary ones. We have an excellent product in It Takes All Kinds of Minds, which is pictured there. And we find ways to work that are effective and meaningful. We think we're a small team that's making a, a significant difference to these families. Our DHS team have a variety of professional backgrounds. And that means we can, allow, uh, means we can offer expert advice on a range of issues. We'll quite often work collaboratively with cases um, just to make sure that we've explored all avenues for the families, something I, that I've not thought of because of my background, somebody else on the team might have more experience of. So for our initial inquiries, there's me and my colleague, Michael. We're office-based and we're the first responders. We take that initial contact from the parents. Um, we have a staged approach. So these, these initial calls are treated as minimal or light in terms of our engagement. So although this slide is meant to be light-hearted, I'm trying to show you, Michael and I have no idea what to expect when that phone rings. I've no idea what the caller's going to say to me. They'll display a range of emotions, anger, frustration, despair, confusion, stress. And it takes skill to be able to field those calls. So the skills that we need to understand the nature of each call are set out in this slide here. 
I'm focusing on calls here, but we do have inquiries by email as well, and we can provide a really detailed response by email if that is what the person's more comfortable with. And we'll always take a lot of care over each response and really tailor it to the individual. So as part of our initial response, which I mentioned before, is very much based on listening. I'm trying to identify whether I can help or whether we're best to signpost to a, a different organisation. So I can offer advice and information immediately on the phone if I know the answer, or I might go away and, and do some more research. For families that need a, that higher level of support, we have Meg and Lisa who lead our team, Vicky, Adam and Sarah who will take on that, that casework level. So some of the families we're supporting are facing such enormous difficulties to try and support their child. In the case of child A here, a suitable school placement was made, but no one coordinated all of the services that he needed. Child A has a social worker who failed to make any plans for him to transition from school because he was on the school roll, despite the fact he was too ill to attend. Child B was much more, she appeared much more able than she actually was. She had no formal diagnosis. We stepped in and made several requests for an assessment of this child's needs, but this was consistently rejected on the basis that the family didn't need any social care input. Other organisations were also making the same request on their behalf. Parents got so concerned for this child that they took her out of school, but without the proper support, the independent school placement they found just didn't work. The child became more unwell, and so did her mother. They endured a long wait for a CAMS appointment, and when it came through, they were offered medication for anxiety and a parenting programme, and that was it. The local mainstream school where this child now attends, part-time, has bent over backwards to accommodate her, but needed our care, our help to get social work um, urgently involved. Finally, after three years, there is now social work involvement. In the meantime, though, the whole family had reached crisis point. The parents and carers that we are working with need to be strong for their children, but they need help to be able to do that. And they shouldn't have to reach breaking point before they get these services. So those were details of live cases. Um, and this and the next slide offer another example of a case with a bit of an interpretation for you at the end of why it was important, what the impact was. So this is a five-year-old with autism and a PDA profile who is only allowed to attend primary school for two hours a day. So at the beginning of the inquiry, we sorted through the key elements um, to see what exactly we would be able to help with, such as supporting them to communicate effectively with the school and helping it explore all of the education options. And we then took the action that we'd agreed with the parent. We keep going until we've undertaken all of the agreed work and hopefully... And usually, we get um, a satisfactory outcome. So this case, it's, it's really important because of the age of the child. The five-year-old had a really inappropriate placement, and there's such a massive potential for this to impact really badly on the child and on the whole family. But having got a positive outcome in the end, the family can see how to approach this situation if something similar should arise in the future. So they now have the tools to be able to help themselves. So, as a parent or carer of a child or young person with additional support needs, you enter this whole new world, and as an organisation supporting those people, our DHS team needs to be up to speed. So when you enter the world of school and education, you have this legislation and guidance. And when you enter the world of additional support needs, you have even more of that. you also encounter a host of education and health specialists. And you find yourself seeking support from other services, and you take on board a whole new lexicon. These slides seem quite full on, and they're meant to, because this is, this is what it's like for the parents and carers that we're supporting there. So delivering a service of this kind to families who are facing all of these potential problems and a complex policy and legal system. For us, it's all about the relationship with those families. Parental engagement is a key policy for education authorities and the value of including parents in their education is widely agreed upon. However, when parents fall into dispute or they're unhappy with their child's school, 
meaningful parental engagement is then really difficult to achieve. Government guidance exists in many places, and here we've highlighted the ASL Code of Practice, which has got a section devoted to parental engagement. So the second bullet point here, it might seem really obvious, but it's so important. As professionals, we're all guilty of, of using jargon and acronyms. I would assume that most of us here will understand these four, but the parents and carers that I'm, I'm talking to don't. Many of the parents and carers that we're supporting have learning difficulties themselves, and this can make the building of positive relationships even more difficult. So it's really important that all of us are alert to that possibility. Whether or not a parent's disclosing anything to you, just keep it in the back of your mind. You just might need to offer information in a different form. Um, sometimes written information is not the best. Sometimes just a text helps. In addition, the school environment might be one that some adults just don't have good feelings about. They've had their own bad experiences and they, they bring that with them when they come to a meeting with you. So we have got a variety of tools and resources which we give to parents and carers. I'm going to highlight these in slides, but we're also going to pass them around for you to have a look at just now. Diana's going to <coughs> frantically run around the room. Yeah. <laughs> You carry on yeah. while I run around the room. So this here, it takes all kinds of minds, is the resource we would most commonly provide to parents and to professionals. I hope many of you will be familiar with it, because this was sent out to every GTCS registered teacher last autumn. Since then, lots of schools have asked us for additional copies, and they're using it in the wider school community. So we, we feel that we've, we've got a good product here. With not only using it um, in schools, we've provided it to education officers um, and outdoor education centres, to residential units and to voluntary bodies um, such as Cycling Scotland. So this here is the child's view form that we use quite often. So important that children and young people are given a chance to express their views. And the form on this slide and the next one that I'm going to show you are a really simple way of doing that. So this doesn't have to be a one-off exercise. You can keep doing this form as, as the child's opinions change and as they're developing. So making use of this type of form as a matter of course helps meet the legal requirements about always having regard to the views of the children or young person. We find them really helpful in two ways. First of all, it's a reminder to the parent to put through the, forward the views of their child and not just their own views. And secondly, it means that you've then got something on record about how the child's thinking, what they're, what they're wanting to achieve. So we've also developed this resource, Top 10 Tips. We developed this based on the advice that we would most commonly give to parents and carers. We know that the techniques here are really helpful to improve understanding of communication on both sides. So tip one, be confident, not confrontational. We're trying to encourage parents to self-advocate, but in a measured way, so they're not just coming in and, and shouting at you. Step two is to consider all offers of support. We're really keen that parents don't get stuck on thinking there's only one solution, and to at least consider all offers of support and not just reject anything out of hand. Step three is to be solution-focused, even. Many parents worry that without a diagnosis, their child won't get any help. We will support families whose children don't have a diagnosis. And we try and encourage thinking about solutions rather than putting any kind of label on what the problem might be. So number four is about communication. We focus on positive communication. And we encourage parents to be reflective about their feelings. So being aware of their feelings before they go into a meeting can just help to take the heat out of it a bit and it makes a potentially difficult meeting a bit more easy to manage on both sides. We also really encourage them to keep written records of communication, just so that everybody has a record of what was actually said and agreed upon, so there's no scope for misunderstandings. Tip five is knowing your rights. So as I've said, information is so important to these parents, and we're trying to make sure that everybody's aware of the legal position, and having this knowledge is really empowering for them. Tip six is to plan ahead. Meetings are a precious use of everybody's time, and so we want the parent to plan to make sure everybody's getting the best out of it that they possibly can. 
Tip seven is about following up. So when you've had that meeting, we encourage the parents to follow up with an email again so that everything's down in writing and there's, there's no scope for misunderstanding. Tip eight is about being realistic. If I only spoke to people about rights and entitlements, I'd just be creating even more conflict. We try to discuss things that seem the most possible and the most likely for each set of circumstances, but still balancing that with what the child actually needs. I've already um, explained the importance of hearing the child's view. So as well as the resources we've shown you, we signpost advocacy services where appropriate. And of course, there's this new service with 12 to 15 year olds who want to take part in decisions about their own additional support for learning, which we also highlight to parents. And that is tip nine, let the child's voice be heard. And finally, we really encourage parents and carers to think about their own needs as well, and just to try and carve out that bit of space for themselves. And that, that's our final tip for them. We often hear of things which professionals say to parents and carers, which can make an already tense situation even worse than somebody's laughing in the background there. We completely understand the pressures that you guys are under, but I'll, I hope that you'll allow me to offer you these tips. Parents don't want to be told that there's 29 other children in the classroom. They know that, but their focus is very much on their own child. They also don't want to hear that there are other children and young people who are so much worse off than their son or daughter is. As I said before, they struggle to feel heard and, and that just makes it worse. And finally, going back to that Coke bottle effect that we were talking about, sometimes it's not till a child gets home that the stresses of the day at school manifest in difficult behaviours. So don't assume that a behaviour that a parent tells you about is a result of poor parenting or the home environment and that school's working perfectly. We're not saying it's definitely one or the other, but just consider that it might be, might be something that you've not thought of. So, the final piece of advice I would like to offer you is to listen. When you're busy and dealing with competing pressures and conflicting demands, I know it can seem like an extra burden, but you will almost certainly find though that if you can manage to find that time just to sit down and listen to a parent, it will pay dividends in the long run. So, as I was saying, it's so easy to access our services. You can either call this number or email us, and families can do that themselves. If professionals want to refer, that's no problem at all. They can phone me and we can talk it through. If they've got the family's permission, they can pass me their contact details and I can make that first step, make that, that initial contact, which is sometimes the hardest bit for parents. If you don't have their permission, you can give them these details and encourage them to give us a call. So we have got a little bit of time for questions and, and a bit of discussion, which Dinah is going to lead while I have a fly down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll, yes, hello. I, I just have a question, a sort of yeah, clue based on that sort of last piece of advice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of a, like a class teacher. I just sort of made a little list of studies as you're speaking, I'm thinking. Throughout my class role, it's relatively low of 23. I have you know, well over half the children who I have additional support concerns about. And when I sit down with my support for learning colleague and explain to her that actually I do have the, the series of concerns very much the response I would receive at that level because of her workload is there are X hundred number of children in the school and there are so many children who are worse off than B. And so I think as you know, as a professional that has concerns for mm -hmm. these kids, often I feel like that's that's the response that we're receiving from the services that are available. Okay. So would you have any advice as to how we can seek to access greater levels of support within our within our schools? Or is it a case of actually needing to reach out to you know, I, I'm feeling like I would be sensitive of perhaps bypassing my colleagues and their expertise within mm -hmm. my school and mm -hmm. saying actually what they're offering isn't, isn't good enough when actually perhaps the reality of that is actually what is being supported. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you do have to just be brave and take that step and say this isn't working, who else can help me and move it up to a higher level. But I, I do understand that that puts you in a difficult position if, if you know, as a, as a professional, if these are your colleagues. But we, we would also just keep pushing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I think what's really difficult for you is that um, there is actually a really strong legislative framework of what parents could be entitled to expect in terms of additional support for learning, but it's not very well resourced. So you're trying to manage with really no none of the resources behind you that you really need for the system to work properly. And so we're trying to work with the parents and with you to sort of pick our way through that, where um, to he help take the heat out of the situation with the parents so we can have rational discussions about what, you know, the art of the possible sort of thing. But also at times it, it, we can help you access more support because sometimes the local authority, in all honesty, will listen if they think there's someone external prodding them uh, and looking at what they're doing. Because so, some of the cases that we've had, um, we've supported parents to go to the tribunal. Um, so, you know, it's not, although we're very keen on a non-confrontational approach, because that, you know, is at the end of the day, it's going to work better for ongoing relationships between the school and the family. Um, there are times when families need to challenge the local authority and say, my child has got rights and entitlements and you're not meeting them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I could totally understand what you're saying. Um, and, and we know that last thing that we say, you know, spend time, listen to a parent, spend time talking to them and hearing them is a big ask because of the time pressure. We I think because quite often I feel that's what this meeting is because I can sit back and listen. Mm. And I know that when I go and ask for that support to be put in place, mm. that even though obviously of course there's that willingness, the school wants the support, but actually if you have the same resources, I, mm. I'm there. So, yeah. But sometimes if you, ask, if you ask the child and you ask the parent, what do you want? They, they maybe don't want something that's resource heavy. I mean, they might want just a minor adjustment that you could do within, within the classroom. I mean, um, you know, the... I don't know, the, these child's view forms, they, what, what the, if you ask the child what they put on there might be something quite simple that actually you can do. You know, they maybe don't like the pens or maybe you've given them a triangular pencil and they hate that. Or, you know, it might, it is worth always just ask, just, just get to the heart of what it is that they want. Some of the asks will be too big and then it's about managing expectations, but some of them won't. in my career that teachers need to be um, we've done training and found out that a lot of te teachers are not resource deprivation or whatever, whatever are not trained in ESL mm -hmm. or ESD at all and so to feel empowered in a tribune and that's exactly that same situation I'm in mean, now in a, a different support needs school so it's very different you need to be empowered yourself and you need to be able to sort of challenge what your peers are doing because what you're saying is really good and you have just as good as, as any other teacher probably as much knowledge in some ways as any other teacher to do something better for that child. But if you're not really empowered about what the child needs and have all this, this um, training and understanding, then I've had to take that on board myself. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a shame because I know that we had, you know, we had a lot of people come up to me and say, I've got a child with autism in my class and I, I cannot cope with him and I don't know how to do it and he shouldn't be here. And I'm like, well, actually he should be there. So what you need to get is the tools to actually cope with that child. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, so yes. I do, and I think that's... If you don't mind me carrying on, no, no. I think that's that's why we managed to get the eighty-five thousand booklet. So um, it takes all kinds of minds out. I mean, it takes all kinds of minds is a very clear, basic exploration of what autism might be or dyslexia, and a few hints about how you might change the way you do things that might support that child. It's, it, but the reason that we were able to distribute it so much is because the GTCS. Uh, wanted it put out, so it went to every single registered teacher. Um, yes, exactly. And we actually gave it also to all the teaching universities for it to be incorporated into the initial teacher education program. I've had a wee bit of trouble trying to get the feedback from the universities about how they've used it, because the worry about something like that is it's just sitting on somebody's desk somewhere but I completely agree with that and I, I think there is a growing recognition that I, ITE needs to improve. I'm just going to say I worked in a YMCC and schools doing support services and we see the children who graduate from services called the disability 
Selbstverständnis bezogen nun habe, wie wir es gut durch unseren Kapitalismus mit der Situation zu diesem Problem. Es gibt ja so viele, wenn man nicht in den Kanal steht, wenn man nicht in den Kanal steht, dann wird das nicht passieren. Wenn Sie so kommen, ja. Also das ist eine Inhalte, die so man sich gut durch die Tür schützt, die Tür fest und sehr wieder in die Rente. Ja, und unfortunately there's nothing you can do to shorten that, although the healthcare services do have these rigid processes and they will stick to them. And I think all you can do is just try and keep them on track without keep chasing up the referrals. And it's, for us, it's about making the parent feel confident that you've done that, mm -hmm. so that they know that, that somebody else has got this for them. They've, got, they've taken this burden. And how many funds is it? So just thank you, do you all? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we've... Um, it, historically, it was always just trust funds, the same old charity saying, yeah. you know, you make applications and we've got some phil philanthropic donors. We changed our name to the Selves and Mind Room Centre because we got some funding from the Selves and Family, a yeah. uh, wealthy Scottish family, phil philanthropists. Um, they don't cover all our costs and all our needs. Um, so, yeah, it, at the moment we're funded by philanthropy individuals we've got some individuals that bake cakes and go on walks and send us the money for that and we have some uh, we do some fundraising events uh, one, one of our board members is mad about golf so we can raise money through golfing events but making applications to trust funds it's just you know the same old third sector um, mix of, of kind of asking for money wherever we, we think we can see it how uh, I would like to say, though, that we don't chase the money. I think the problem for some third sector is you see a pot of money and you run after it, uh, and, and that takes you away from your core aims. But we're very stuck on our, you know, we know what, what works and we know what we want to keep doing, mm -hmm. and we'll find, the, we'll find the money to help us do that, not that we'll rush off because there's money somewhere else. Um, I, I, if it's okay, I would wanted to ask you a question about what it's like for you as teachers if we if we come into a meeting to support a parent I mean do you do you welcome that or do you find it uncomfortable or you know what what uh, what's that like for you it's a complicated it's really not a picture of that mm -hmm. but talking about that I think uh, you definitely have to upskill yourself if it's left to you you could be left to throw the point to the fire sometimes I think in teachers to get off a very stressed period you come to cause a very tricky period it's actually a very stressed period so it's actually quite a skilled um, process, isn't it, to, to be very calm if somebody's just going to basically offload to you about how difficult their life has been. Mm. You know, we have that sort of problem on a daily basis in our school, children with autism and uh, special support needs, and you really have to see past the very, some say, very aggressive, very critical parents, um, and that's not always easy because, you know, we're human beings and we get upset and it can be fairly personal sometimes. Um, and I guess it's that last point as well, where you feel that this child is coping very well and um, progressing and um, loves school, and then all of a sudden, if, if, if the parent comes in at, at the same point and says, No, that's not what your life's got to be, and um, it's, it's can be very yeah. confrontational, yeah. and it, is a, it can, can become a shock to you when you think, Right, okay, I'm not seeing that. And you don't want to say, but say the reasons behind it, but you do get a, a shock when somebody suddenly says to you, that's not happening at home, and, um, and it's really difficult then to, to try and tease out reasons behind it. Mm -hmm. And it could be because they're all the day, they're sitting um, doing their routine and they're performing, and, mm -hmm. and they get into the taxi and it's just a, but um, it, it, it does become a confrontation sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and there is so much emotion behind it, for not just for the parents, but for you guys as well. You know, you, you're so in, invested in, in your pupils. I know. Come in think, what am I doing wrong? And yeah. Exactly. And that's yeah. going back to one of the, the top tips. Uh -huh. We're we're saying just take a minute and, and reflect, think about how you're feeling before you you storm into this meeting. Mm -hmm. And so we're on, but on both sides, we're just trying to encourage a bit of reflection and really just looking for a solution, not not pinpointing blame. It, it doesn't matter, but try and sort out what you can do to help.
I mean, I think we, we're really keen that the parents ultimately would be able to go into that kind of meeting and speak up for themselves, but often they can't. So we try and, you know, if, if as Mel said, you know, once it's escalated up our kind of staged approach, you probably spend quite a bit of time planning for the meeting. You know, what's your list? What, what, what do you really want to say? Try and park the whole history and just look at where, where you're at now and where you'd like to get to. Let's work towards that and make it more manageable and, and so on. So it probably is helpful in that setting to have someone go through that with the parent. Usually with the older people, like you said, that they both go through it, although we both, you know, when they never mean to, we just keep going. I'd, I wanted also to ask you whether... Um, whether uh, you think, I mean, you've mentioned a gap in teacher training, but I wonder if you think that engaging with parents and how to do that is also a gap in teacher training, or is that something that you you have? Um, you think you think it is? It's missing. I think it's also missing that step because, well, it's got to be a reciprocal process. Everyone needs to become a teacher by starting process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when the, when the parents are sort of contesting and challenging and what have you, it probably is more at local authority level. By then it's kind of, mm -hmm. you know, you're really telling the local authority that this school or this teacher needs something more to, to help provide the support that everyone's identified this, that the child needs. So I think hopefully we, we certainly never encourage a sort of anti-teacher talk of any, of any kind. Um, we know that the teachers are the allies for the children and, and we've got to get the parents to, to be part of that whole picture. Well, I know it's coming up, <laughs> up for lunchtime, but we're, we're, we're going to be around all day, so we'll be very happy to answer yeah, questions. We've got some business cards with us if you wanted to take the contact. Yeah,